You need to put a L in your name, so it's Wild Man. I've been called that. <laughs> Woodman, Wild Man. That was probably when I was younger, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's when it was more important to be able to be, de yeah. be described that way. Right. Uh, I have to be the rudder now. That's right. <laughs> Steady, straight. That's right. Smooth. So here we go. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. All right, everybody, welcome to AutoLine After Hours, especially you, my co host, Sir Gary Vassilak. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great. You know, when I walked out in the studio, we, we have a lot of cars in this studio. Yeah. When I walked out and saw this thing, yeah. Man, that looks good. It pops. That, that really looks good. It pops. And we'll tell everybody what's in the studio in a minute. But first, got to tell them that Todd Lassa from Automobile Magazine is here with us again. Hello, John. How you doing there, I'm Todd? well. Yeah. Good to be here. Thank you. I know you're doing well because before we came into the studio, you told me that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, we got to well. sort of fake it because this still is well. the, the yeah. beginning of the He's show. He's still doing okay. We're not supposed to talk about what we spoke of before, That's right? right. Yeah, but it, but it may all fall apart by the end of the show, and, and we don't know what that's going to be like. Okay. <laughs> okay, we got a great show for everybody. In the second half, we're going to have Bud Danker here with Penske Automotive and the Detroit Grand Prix. We'll be talking all about Indy and Detroit Grand Prix and good stuff. But right now, our special guest is Carl Widman, and he's the chief engineer for Ford Performance. And Carl, it's great to have you with yeah, us. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me by. Okay, now, Gary, you can tell everybody what's in the studio. Well, we ought to have Carl tell us what's okay. in the studio. This is his baby. It is. That's right. So what we have is the 2019 GT350, um, most powerful, naturally aspirated engine we have in Ford Motor Company. Uh, just a real track-focused car. Uh, for 19, we've done some refinements. Uh, the team can never let go. They're always crafting on it. Uh, just trying to make something acceptable. Some refinements <laughs> grossly understates what you guys have done with this car. All right, but, but you said this is, this is the most powerful, normally aspirated engine that you guys have. What is the, this, the specs? Tell me, tell so me what they So it's uh, 526 horsepower. Um, and so for, for us, what we would do with this car, this is just a pleasure on the track, right? So we had them out uh, with you guys what, less than a week ago. So for 19, what's new is we have a Cup 2 tire on it, and it just gives it a great set of shoes. So nice in grip, uh, real linear, progressive, much easier to position the car, so really flat on the driver. And it changed the car so much, we actually had to change the spring rates in the front, the bars in the backs, and then uh, worked with our driver, Billy Johnson, runs for IMSA for us. Uh, and he was able to kind of dial in what we wanted to do for the software on the ABS. And we actually wrote, wrote new strategy from his input so we can actually go into the corner and not lose a lot of speed and just, you know, drift it right out. So uh, a lot of uh, refinements in the electronics of the chassis, uh, both from the Magnaride systems and the brake controls and all those things that make it just that pleasure to drive, the seamless nature of this car on a track. You mentioned that you've got you've got new tires. Now you developed the tires specifically with, with Michelin for, for this. Right, vehicle. so we have a partnership with Michelin. So how this one went is uh, we're at the track with the GT500, which again is new for, uh, for the next model here. So this is a 19. So we had the 350Rs out and uh, we always benchmark a track, whether we go to NOLA or wherever, so we'll always have those. And it's one of those things, Michelin's there doing development on the new tires for the 500, and we're like, you know, if we just had a little bit better tire in the 350, and then the next time we go to the track, Michelin's got a set of tires for us, we'll run those and then tune the rest of the car around it. So with Michelin, you know, and um, all the team we have from Ricardo to Brimbo and stuff, they're usually around for the track, and uh, because we're developing the 500, which is a big program, we'll keep working on the uh, 350 to keep pushing it forward. Are you seeing any uh, bigger numbers in lateral grip uh, because of the tires or yeah. more of a feel yeah. sort of thing? It actually is faster on the track, so overall performance. But uh, the big thing for us, uh, 
was we wanted to get a tire that we went from a, an old pilot sport, right? So probably developed back in 2013. And because our development times are a little quicker, so it's like five years progression in tires, which, you know, it's, it's huge, right? So we got more grip, same wet performance. Um, and then what I like about it, it's, it's real progressive. So you can really grow with the car as you drive it. And uh, just that feedback that we've done with the brakes and, uh, and the Magnaride tuning, just gives you that confidence when you get into it and keep pushing it and pushing it. So it doesn't snap at the limit. Yeah, you got it. Let's go back to the engine a minute because this is that flat plane yep. crank. For those who don't understand the advantage of it, give us the the Y4 as you did it. So so the Y4 on a, on this track car is uh, it'll you can run it up to 8,000 RPM. So when you're on a track, you can basically run most tracks in just two gears, and it's just that pleasure of you can go in and out and focus on driving and positioning it with the manual transmission. And with a manual, it just gives us that total capability that when you upshift, you've got the capability uh, that you don't lose power through, right? And so we'll, we'll peak out horsepower around 7,500 RPM. And so we still got that band going up to 8,000 that we're still pulling. And so that's what's great about it. Uh, of course, the vibration and the feel and the sound is totally unique. So uh, this is a car. Go into the sound because, uh, as you mentioned, we got to drive it on the track a little less than a week ago. There's a crackle to it. There's yeah. a raspiness to it. What, what is causing that? The flat plane crank has a, a totally different sound to it. And, in, and with it, it has a vibration. So not only do you get that high RPM, but it's really created the character of the car since we've launched it. And it really has a following. I mean, when we fire these up at, at base and everybody just gets a smile on their face and when you drive it it just the sensation comes through both acoustic and then as you feel it rev up so it's that whole emotional experience that you're just tied into that car with the manual shifter you can feel everything kind of going on and it's that visceral sense that raw nature of that flat plane crank that creates the total experience of a 350 uh, which is nothing like it. No one else has a flat plane crank that is, you know, over five liters in displacement. So that was a, a big technical challenge when we did it mm. back in 2015. Uh, a lot of long days for uh, the engine team to basically be able to contain that vibration with the rest of the vehicle because uh, it feels nice now, but when our initial ones were out, it was a little bit much. So, Carl, you've uh, mentioned at uh, some events, uh, some uh, presentations for this car and for the GT500 that they're slightly different uh, uh, target buyers for them. Can you talk about the, kind yeah. of the difference in flavor between the GT500 and GT350? Right, so it's the first time since 1970 we've had both available. Um, so if you look at the 350, it's that raw track car, naturally aspirated manual, right? So for those people of what's their focus, their dream, Mustang, that delivers on it, both from the sensation of that progressive nature of it, easy to throw around, easy to learn how to do it, and then the sound that creates with it. The 500, you open the 500 up, it is, it is a track race car. And you get into the 500 with the over 700 horsepower and a you know, dual clutch transmission. It's this whole different sensation of just raw brute force power. Um, it's like the only one vehicle I've ever driven that I can't use the full range of throttle running out at Unadilla. It's just so much power in that car so quick. The transmission will knock it through the gears in less than 100 milliseconds, right? It is insanely fast uh, car that when I drive it on public roads, it's very hard to keep it under 100 miles an hour. It is so fast. When it comes alive uh, in the hands of a, a driver <coughs> who can really push the limits on it, uh, you're on a track, the big track, so it's like a big track car that you can drive 150, 107 miles an hour on a track. In the way that that vehicle set up is we were gonna take the most of that engine and push it out there. So in essence, it's the pinnacle. Uh, so it's got front, front rotors that are the size of the wheels of the old 65. They're 16 and a half <laughs> inches. <laughs> They're giant. We're looking at them right here, and you're right. Yeah. I've had cars with smaller <laughs> wheels than you got rotors on this. I thing. still have cars with smaller wheels. Than <laughs> so the 500 is, is is this vehicle that's really pushing the limits of what 700 horsepower can and put to the ground, and and so it's this extreme vehicle that really flirts with supercar capability when you put it on the track. Yeah, I was thinking it. It sounds like you're kind of basically going after a Ferrari or a Porsche. Um, yeah. GT3 or something. Uh, right, because what our goal was was try to give it that same handling characteristics of the 350, but you're pushing like over 200 more horsepower through it. So, so for the for the 500, 
that would be trailered to where it's going. You could conceivably drive the 350 to the track? Yeah, yeah, and so we, we set them up the both, right? But our, our, our view of the 500 customer is probably we get trailered there. Um, and then when you look at the aerodynamics of, of the setup of a 500 versus a 350, we share the base cars, base 350s, 500s, or the standard setups, use the same rear deck lid spoiler. So the technology we've done to set up what is the best era of a spoiler, and you trade off between downforce and drag, that's pretty much what we call the swing. So we've used that on both the 19 350 and then also on a GT500. You get into the 500 when you put a carbon fiber wing on it, it's a wing set up to run at high speed. So it, you know, it's when we run it at VIR, say 120 miles an hour, it's almost 300 pounds of downforce. You run it up to 170, it's like 500 pounds of downforce when you put it in track mode. So the reason we need that much downforce is we're moving that fast. And when you come up over a rise, you want to plant the rear wheels. So it's just, we run so much faster through a corner and through the straights with a 500, it's really driven totally new chassis, totally new brakes totally new aero and so when you see it it's got twice the frontal opening of a 350 and 50% more airflow through it so the vehicles end up driving to a chassis in an aerodynamic setup that gets the maximum out of the motor and still gives you that track balance for both of them but one of them just goes a ton faster on a straight uh, to put you on the defensive a little, little bit it sounds like the 350 is maybe a little bit more of a tactile car you, you have a naturally aspirated engine you have a manual gearbox yeah it's that visceral nature right yeah. so we have um, as you come to it we knew the 500 to get the most we can get out of the uh, engine we needed a DCT there was just no manual transmission that could transmit the torque through it so fast yeah. uh, so it had to go to a DCT to get the most out of it Whereas a naturally aspirated high revving motor gives you more time to, because you can't shift the manual transmission in 100 milliseconds, right? You'll, you'll have the clutch down. John maybe. Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it really is that, that fun to drive nature of, you know, the visceral sense, the vibration, the fun. They'll both put a smile on your face, but they'll be totally different experiences when you go put them on the track. Let's talk uh, more of the arrow back on the GT350. You also have a, a wicker bill, a gurney flap that you can put on the, the go into why you gave the, the owner that choice. Right, so as we, as we were doing this dual development, what we wanted to do when we come up with a, with a new deck lid spoiler, we wanted to provide more flexibility to the customer. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the guys that work with me in, on the team really track their cars, right? And so it's that, that concept, how can you get the experience that someone has a vehicle that they can learn with it, grow with it. And so what we did is it's set up, you can either order it through the parts catalog or order it directly when you order your car. And it's basically a gurney flap that in essence gives you more downforce at the rear. If you're running a higher speed track, you, you want more downforce than the, than the setup we have. Um, and so that gives you that capability to decide what you want to run, what, what makes you feel comfortable and get you that experience that you can tune your vehicle. Uh, and so the, that's the idea of it. We also send with that um, an adjustable front strut tower uh, mount. And what that does is give you the ability to change your camber. And then mm -hmm. you can decide how you want to drive it to the track and what tire wear you want driving to the track. But when you put more front camber in it, if you're on a short track, it's really going to turn in a lot quicker. And so it, it's giving that customer the ability to have a more interaction with their car of how they want to tune it without... Um, you know, having to pick through 50 different things on the online. And so what the guys work with to kind of provide that. That's fun. I mean, you get yeah. to set up your car for the track that you're driving at. Yeah. And so I think it, that comes out of a lot of the stuff we're doing now with user experience, right? So we will do a lot across all of our programs with Raptor is we'll talk about user experience and how, how people use the cars. And what comes out of that is ideas that we can make the product more engaging for the customer, right? Because these are all emotional purchase decisions. Everything we do in Ford Performance, right? I, you know, it's tremendously fun, and you're always trying to key into that emotion of this is the track car, it's raw. This is the high-speed track car, which is at the limit of whatever technology we can put to it. And then a Raptor, of course, is uh, sheer fun of, you know, doing things you shouldn't be allowed to do in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, Carl, who is the customer for this car? So this one, um, it's someone who, who either has this desire, um, and it can be across a, a band of ages. I've met 
people who have retired who have this has been the purchase they want. I've met people who they're moving up from an old 500 and want to get into a track ready car, or people who have traded in bosses for it, or people coming to a sport. It's someone that still may daily drive this one, um, but wants to get something that's track ready, can run it on the track, and, and have that fun, that experience, the interaction with people, right? A lot of, a lot of track events is a communal event, right? Uh, and a lot of what Mustang is, is, is that communal. Uh, so that, that's the target customer, so it's kind of an emotional state than a, than a demographic. Mm -hmm. We've got some questions here from uh, the audience. Vince33X says, Mr. Whitman, no matter how you cut it, we're in the golden age of ICE uh -huh. performance. Yes. I, he says, I think the ICE has a long way to go before it gives in to EVs, if ever. What do you think? I mean, you look at this engine, and there's nothing like it before it, and so you're over 100 horsepower per liter. You are sheer smile. Naturally like, aspirated. Naturally too. aspirated. That's, that's a really impressive. So that, to me, that's one of those targets that's always been on. So we smash through that, but then you provide this whole vibration experience. And then you look at the engine we have in the GT500, which is we're still working on it to get the final horsepower number, but you're still talking about over 700 horsepower out of a 5.2 liter supercharged, and then putting it through a DCT transmission that can pick its gear in 100 milliseconds. These are, these are technologies we've never brought to bear in a Mustang before, so yeah, and then our crosstown rivals are playing in the same sandbox, so the, the breadth of choice is bigger than it was. We say 1970 is the last time we've had those wrestle choice. If you cross the segment, it is the golden age. So, but will be tweaking these cars in the next few years be enough work for you to do, or will you be put on, a, on an EV performance uh, project? I think we always look ahead to what's coming and always pushing our limits and then working through emissions and all that stuff. So we're always doing the balance and really keeping an ear to the ground on what the customer wants, right? So we really have to deliver that experience that our customers want back to user experience. So we're always testing that in, in different ways. So we're always keeping our eyes open. We're always down on Woodward all day on uh, talking to, you know, over a thousand Mustang owners all day to, to get that feel, right? Yeah, in fact, that, that preempts a question from Ben Pinales. He wanted to know when you're going to make an electric Mustang. Yeah, we're always, we're always keeping our eyes open. Uh, I think what we've announced is a uh, Mustang-inspired EV will be coming soon. Well, you mentioned Woodward, and, you know, I, I think back to, you know, early Mustangs and early Camaros and, and GTOs and things like that, which, which would race on Woodward or race on Telegraph. And, you know, and that's straight line racing, but you guys really, really emphasize being able to handle the curves with this car. Absolutely. So anything we do in Mustang from the Gen 6 has a lot to do with, again, uh, the handling capability. When we, we export Mustangs um, on the base programs, the performance packs go to Germany. You know, we're still the fourth year in a row, the highest selling sports car, two-door sports car in the world, right? A lot of that has to do with what we put in that we want to basically handle. So the that generation with the new front rear suspension um, was critical to us to really expand the Mustang brand, both for our dealers overseas and everywhere. And you know, 25 to 30 percent of our Mustangs we build out of Flat Rock, our exports. So it's also huge to our manufacturing community. I had no idea the number was that big. Yeah, wow, it's, that's when impressive. You, when you look at you know you know why I'm in the business is American manufacturing, right? And so you look at the responsibility these products have to keep delivering. We really had to go that way, right? And you look at the Halo products we have; they're really using the same structure, using a lot of the same general kinematics. We have different front and rear suspension components to get wider wheels, wider tires, but they're still generally the same kinematics that we have that is the base car. And then you look at 500, very much so we knew that that had to be the pinnacle, right? To be the pinnacle, it had to be the GT350R around a track, right? Which is a tremendously high hurdle. Uh, with the amount of power that has and still be stable. So it always gets into, it has to handle to be a halo to the, the sixth generation Mustang. So I'll ask you outright, will, uh, will you be working on a performance version of the uh, Mustang inspired electric vehicle? It's a different team that's working through that. Okay. So um, we're still trying to figure out exactly where we might go with it. Hey, uh, we also get phone calls uh, yeah. from the audience, and Carmen, I know we got a couple of them. Let's bring in the first. Hi, this is Roger from Fairfield, Connecticut, for Carl. <clears throat> Carl, I, uh, I'm an 18 uh, Mustang GT owner, love the car, 
really pushed it over the top. It's a dream car. Do have concerns though about all these engine problems everybody's showing up with on the internet and elsewhere. Uh, and wanted to see if you could comment on what's going on with the ticking and the uh, engine failures and replacements and the oil consumption, especially in the GT350. I see car and driver had to put in 21 quarts of oil in 40,000 miles on top of the dealer changes, which is just uh, eye opener. Anyway, thanks for all the good work and keeping these cars going. We love them. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Um, the 350s do have higher oil consumption than the base engines. Um, that is true, uh, just just to the nature of, of the compression we run through them. Um, I'll, I'll follow up on the, the five liter comments. I haven't. I'm not aware of any. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes the internet can go hog wild on an issue yeah. that is maybe not that common spread. I'm not saying that that's the case no, no, I, here, but sometimes that happens. Yeah, so we'll follow up on it. Okay. Appreciate the information. Um, let's see. Sean Sweeney wants to know, when are we going to see the S650 program Mustang based on the CD6 platform? Oh, that's interesting. Um, so I don't think I have the details I can share with him. That's fine. It. That's yeah. that's a good answer. Good question, <laughs> Sean. <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned the R. Is there going to be an R of this? The 350 comes in uh, in a non-R and an R. The R is um, is uh, a carbon fiber wheel, um, a more aggressive semi-slick, and a rear seat delete. So it's for someone uh, who's not going to carry anybody around in the back seat. You've done some really interesting things with the current Mustang. With uh, you have, as you point out, a, a, a track car that handles well, like a. I guess uh, in the old days we'd say like a European sports car, uh, and then you you have a um, I can't I believe it's your group uh, did the uh, uh, did the spec uh, drag racer for example two right, so four performance four parts will still make two spec Mustangs one's the Cobra Jet and uh, it's interesting you can order it through the parts counter right so it's a part number as a non street legal supercharged um, custom setup uh, Cobra Jet. So you can drag right out of the crack, out of the gate. They have also what is a GT 350S, which is a caged, uh, caged race car that you can build, get built off the 350 setup. Mm -hmm. Different coolers, everything set up as a race car. Again, yeah. non-street legal. Okay, Eugene wrote in to say he's got an idea how to beat the Dodge Demon. All you need is a wide-body uh, drag strip radials, a 900 horsepower uh, supercharger, and he would buy one ASAP. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure someone will uh, tweak out the 500s when we, uh, the first one we ship to uh, put drag radials on it. Here's a throwback. Barry Rector from Indianapolis wants to know, when are you going to make a Hertz rent a racer version of the GT500? Because back in the day, that uh, happened. Yeah, it's the last couple of Hertz is uh, Shelby America has done. So, I, again, I wouldn't doubt. That's their headache. That, that, you're that, not going to take that on, right? No, they've been doing that. And it's, uh, it's a good thing Shelby America's relationship with Hertz probably will end up doing that again. I think they just did one uh, for a different company. Yeah. Here we got it. Yeah, one of the originals on the left-hand side there and up on the screen now. They did another one, I think, in 15 or 16. Oh, okay. Uh, hey, we got another phone call. Uh, Carmen, let's bring that in. Greetings, gentlemen. This is Dale Leonard from Cleveland, Ohio. And I just want to extend a huge thank you to Carl for at least keeping a manual uh, transmission. Uh, look, hey, Carmen, we're, uh, we're, we're not I've getting the audio out here in the studio. I've been years old, been driving manual so, since uh, I was 16. We'll move on to uh, another question. There's uh, a a couple of uh, questions here for you, Carl. One from Maple Ridge, uh, British Columbia. That's Zach. And George Ginnels wants to know, wh why would you stick with the, the pre-facelift version of the car? I know you don't do styling, but. So, no, it was actually uh, a combination between uh, studio and engineering. Uh, so what it, both the 350 and 500 run the 2015 headlamps setup. And why that is, is the 350 and 500 both have unique fenders. Uh, unique hood systems. Um, 500 is taller to get the supercharger in and has a really huge uh, air extraction system to make it work at high speeds. But both of them drive to a very low front nose to get it sleek for lift. And also we use the same carbon fiber um, part, we call it a, 
a GOR, a grill opening reinforcements, is yeah. a technical term. It holds the radiator and everything else <laughs> that's important in the front. It holds our side coolers and everything. So it's a lightweight part at the very front of the car, which is what you want to get, you know, get the weight off the front, and especially with these big V8s. So we wanted all that stuff to be the same as we went forward between 350 and 500 because they both want to have the lowest front lift. They want to be neutral, and we want to be the lowest weight in front. And so we just used the headlamps that went with that bolster. Okay, the, the control room just took a synopsis from uh, the caller. It's from uh, Dale Leonard from uh, Cleveland. Just wanted to give you a great shout out. Thank you, thank you, thank you for keeping <laughs> a manual transmission in the Mustang. Yep, absolutely. We run uh, the manual in the 350, and that's the only transmission in that one. And then uh, you get a choice on the base Mustangs between 10-speed uh, autos and uh, manuals. Hey, quick question. We're getting down to the end here, but Ford Performance. I mean, you do more than Mustangs, right? What, what's your playground? What's it include? So the playground includes uh, globally, we have responsibility for the European vehicles, which are then Fiesta, Focus, STs. Um, we have in the U.S., we, we do the Raptors, of course, which is a big thing for us. It's probably the highest volume for performance product we have. Um, we just launched a new one for 19 with, uh, again, taking um, electronic technology into the shocks. So a totally different setup with Fox from racing uh, off-road shocks. They're three inches in diameter. They're totally a different thing than we do on uh, the BWI stuff here on Mustang. And then uh, in Asia Pacific, we work on the Ranger Raptor, which is just launching through a global. And in the U.S., we, uh, we assist the, the teams to do the new um, Edge and Explorer STs. So we're branching out into SUV STs here in the States. So uh, it's, a, it's a busy day. It's a large group uh, every day. We got something going on uh, as we go through it. And of course, we have the GT. Uh, can't forget that. Um, uh, Unfortunately, it's sold out already. Clearly, yeah. there's, <laughs> clearly there's, there's interest in performance vehicles even today. I mean, that... Uh, yeah, from the lineup, uh, we'll see different people come to it. A Mustang, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of that Mustang, that emotional state. Uh, but the, the envelope of Mustang that I'm responsible for from mid-20s up to, you know, the price to be announced on 500. But it's tremendous breadth of Mustang that fits what that person wants. And then as we branch out in the SUVs, it's um, it's refining our our DNA as we we apply that to an SUV to that customer. You know they still want decent ride, but we would like you know good linear turn in, a unique tire to go with it, a powertrain that's responsive. So uh, and of course the appearance that is uh, known for Ford Performance. And, and how do you do that? I mean on, on the up upcoming Explorer ST, you've got yep. 21 inch wheels. Those are that's a lot of unsprung weight, and you've got a much bigger vehicle than this. It must be a little bit strange if not disheartening to go from working on a car like this to working on a car like Explorer. So can you tell us so, how, how do you make that work? So a lot of what we'll talk about is is driver connectedness or uh, a, a more emotional driving experience than maybe a, a, a base vehicle in that lineup would be. Okay. So as you make that choice, you've got the appearance, which is relatively easy to figure out how to do appearance and get that experience, appearance mm -hmm. nature. What gets tricky is as we do the shift strategy controls, is getting a real connected shift setup for whatever transmission and engine. But on the Explorer, it was pretty, wasn't too bad because mm -hmm. if you think about it, we've got a full you know, rear drive platform now. Right, right? Right. There's a lot going for us and then that the engine is just phenomenal. But talk, about, talk about a, a three-liter motor that's 400 horsepower, right? Yeah. I mean. <laughs> but you can't make the, the steering too quick. It's, it's a tall vehicle. Right. All that so it's all, thing. It's all about. You can't make it too stiff. Right. You, it's the linearity and progressive nature of it. So when you get behind the wheel, you feel that you're in control and command. And so it's not going to be as a quick turn in as a, a sport on a cup too, right? Sure. You, but it matches that, that emotion of the vehicle that you get. And it's not going to be as loud as a GT500 when you're fired up in your driveway, right? It's, so it, it may kind of be toned down, but it fits that customer and it, as they approach the product, right? Yeah. Hey, look, we're going to have to wrap this segment up. Real interesting, though. Right? You know, I, I've driven this car, the GT350, loved every second of it. And I love how you described it. It's so visceral. Yeah. I mean, you feel the car Absolutely. more than anything else. Well, Carl, thanks for coming well, on. We'll, for we're, we'll definitely have you back again at some point. Oh, right? please do. Pretty local, actually, for us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs>
Well, good. We're going to take a quick commercial break, give some time to the companies that make the show possible, and then we're going to bring Bud Danker on from Penske Automotive. We'll be gone for just a flash. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. All right, we're back. And what we should let everybody know now is we've got another guest here sitting here, Bud Danker, president of Penske Corporation. And you've got maybe the two busiest weeks of the year starting right now in your, in your schedule. Is that right? With Indy coming up yeah. this weekend and then Detroit Grand Prix after that. And then, of course, Charlotte 600, the 600 and Coca-Cola as well on, uh, on, on Sunday night. So it was a busy weekend for us. And it's a big weekend for us, too, because this is Roger's 50th anniversary at the Indy 500, if you can believe it. So uh, 17 wins, looking for the 18th coming on Sunday, 18 poles with Simon on the pole. And then, uh, of course, we'll be qualifying later for the Coke 600. So it's a, it's a very big weekend for us. <laughs> All right. so, so tell us about what you're feeling at both of these races that will be Sunday. Well, on Sunday we've got four cars. Elio Castroneves is, uh, is, comes back for the Indy 500, looking for his fourth win. There's only uh, been a few other guys, you know, AJ and Rick and Unser, who's won four, looking for his fourth. El Elio runs for us typically in the Acura Sports Car Program with IMSA, and then we've got uh, Will Power, who's qualified on the uh, on the second row along with uh, uh, Simon, or, uh, Joseph Newgarden, and then we've got, uh, of course, in the pole with Simon Pagano. So we have four four silver bullets in the gun there. And then, of course, down in NASCAR world in, uh, in Charlotte, we've got uh, four cars, three technically Team Penske, um, with, of course, uh, Brad Keselowski and Ryan Blaney and Joey Logano. And then we've got an alliance with the Wood Brothers with, uh, with Paul Menard. So four cars down there as well. So there's a lot going on. And in addition to that, we have two races in Australia. If that wasn't enough. For so the supercar super car program, right. So Scott McLaughlin is leading the, leading the championship right now, and Fabian Coltard, who's number two. Um, they're both in the championship hunt, one, two, and so far we've won 10 out of the first 12 races, but knock on wood for 13 and 14. And okay, then, so what, what is supercar? I mean, everybody knows what IndyCar is, everybody knows what NASCAR is, but supercar. Well, V8 supercar is, the, is really the NASCAR program of, of Australia. Um, it's the Fords and it's the Holdens, uh, Fords versus Chevrolets over there. Nissans are racing there as well, too. There's about 16 events a year. They race twice a weekend, typically, Saturday and Sunday. All road courses. All road courses. No ovals. Great courses throughout the course of all of Australia and Tasmania and New Zealand. And they have one of the most iconic races in the, in the world called the Bathurst 1000. It's a 1,000 kilometer race up and down a mountain called Mount Panorama. I never miss it. It's one of the best racetracks I've seen in the world, and I've been to a lot of them around the world, but this race is epic. 200,000 plus people camped on the side of a mountain. It's just a wow. great, great event. So those are all what's happening this weekend. Has that series in Australia changed at all since uh, GM and Ford pulled manufacturing out of the country? Has that made any difference? Good, good question. Cars? Yeah, because just in the last three years, there's no longer any production of GM in Australia or Ford in Australia. They right. come from obviously other parts of the world. We learned today a lot, of, a lot of Ford Mustangs now. Ford Mustang was was unveiled just a year and a half ago in Australia, and now is the number two selling Ford vehicle in all of Australia already. Wow. People love high performance over there. They they love the EcoBoost. They love V8s over there, of course, as well still. But you know what's which, which really has changed is the fact that now with the Mustang there. 
maybe even more of a passionate fan, that Mustang holder, that there's a love for Mustang in that, in that country like there's never been. And now with the Falcon, who hasn't been, been produced in a number of years, off the track, the Mustang has really reinvigorated the sport. Ratings are up 15% on TV over there right now because of the introduction of the Mustang against that hold. And so it's like NASCAR, in my mind, 20 years ago, this real competitiveness of OEM and manufacturer. Um, driver is probably secondary. Manufacturer over there is still number one. Yeah. Are, are these cars stock cars as in the, you know, that Mustang that's sitting right there versus the NASCAR version of Indeed. these cars. Yeah, I, I think other than them being, of course, a shell in the interior, they, they are truly uh, a stock car. I mean, they, uh, uh, when you see one, you'll know it's a Mustang. You'll know it's coming off the, off the factory floor Mustang. Now, of course, we make them and we produce them and we do all of that, but and the chassis and all of that too, but they are truly a, a, truly a beautifully specced Mustang car that we've developed over here with Ford Performance with Carl and his team just the past year and a half. And uh, they developed a superb race car over there. They are so fun to drive. They're so fast. Coming down the mountain of Mount Calamara, the panorama rather, they'll be coming down there over 300 kilometers per hour. Wow. That's cranking. They're hauling the mail. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but, but That's so about the, 180, over 180. Yes, it is. You so bet. the Chevy, is that mile still an hour. based on a rear drive car? I, I thought the rear yes. drive cars went away in Australia. No, they're all, they're all rear drive cars still. They're, they're, they are over there, including the Mustang, of course. The Holden's rear drive as well. The Nissan. The is, Holden, is, rather. They, yes, they are all, yeah. they're all rear drive right st still. Rear drive is a big deal for the folks in Australia, right? Yeah, and yeah. Um, so we're, we're happy to be there. We've been now in that, that series now for four years, our fifth year going on now. We've got a big business in Australia now. We do almost a billion dollars a year in Australia, Penske does. So it's a great way to tie our business together, like it is here in the U.S. Okay, as long as we're talking about racing, there's still one category you're in. We can't uh, forget your IMSA car, sports car effort. Yeah, we've been, this is our second year now as the factory team for, for the DPI program in IMSA. Uh, Juan Montoya, of course, is in that series, along with Elio Castroneves and Dane Cameron and Ricky Taylor. So we have a great program there with Acura. You won the last race. We did. Very good homework, John. We won the race in, I watched in, it. That's in, in, in Mid-Ohio. <laughs> yeah. Right. Elio won the race there with his teammate. And uh, so we love, we love sports cars. Roger, as you know, started in sports cars back in the 50s, and he's never locked, lost the passion for strategy and fuel mileage and different set, you know, it's just great strategy. Double, two drivers, three drivers in some of the races and, you know, in Sebring, obviously, and other races like that. And, and his ultimate hope is to get back to Le Mans. Roger really? wants to get to Le Mans some year. Okay, and, so and let's talk about that. Not, not that specifically, but, you know, in Indy, you're with Chevrolet. In IMSA, you're with Acura. In NASCAR with Ford, in Supercar with Ford, in the past you've done Porsche programs. And how do you figure out when to get into a program. You guys clearly are agnostic. We've seen other teams that are very loyal to one brand. They never v deviate from it. They, you guys, you'll go racing with anybody. Yeah, well, well, remember, we sell 40 brands of vehicles, too, in our dealerships, right? So you talk about being very agnostic, right? So we've, we sell over 500,000 cars a year retail, new and used. Which combined. is a massive amount. Big business, um, about $23, $24 billion business. And just the automotive side alone every year, it's got 27,000 employees now on our automotive side. So um, so we're partners with everybody. I mean, we really are. We, you know, we, we talk to everybody all the time, the, from BMW to Porsche. We're always in the mix in terms of what is their next iteration of, of drivetrain, what's their next strategy around racing as well too, and, 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 and frankly, these guys come to us sometime and say, we'd love to have as, as our partner. Acura came to us and said, we want to get back into DPI, seriously. Um, we want to get back into winning the day 25, uh, the, the 24 hours of Rolex there, seriously, and would you be our partner there? So a lot of it's, you know, we can go to them sometimes and talk about strategy, but they also come to us and talk strategy as well, too. And, and we'll align with what the program we think can win. We, we want to win, right? So okay, as you know, in, in uh, the FIA right now, there's a big de determination as to what the ultimate category should be. Yes. You know, the, the P1 cars. Uh, FIA, I guess, has been promoting this hypercar concept, battery hybrid, blah, 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 uber expensive way to go. Yes. Meanwhile, DPI looks like the, the, that whole category has hit a home run, all kinds of uh, manufacturer interest. If, if, if DPI, if the FIA decided, yeah, okay, we're going to go and allow DPIs to, to run at Le Mans, would that be the way that Penske Auto or Racing got back to Le Mans? We hope so. 
We hope so. There's a lot of if, ifs and ifs. I know there's a lot of ifs, yeah. You're dealing with FIA and ACO and other rules, obviously. And so they've got to align the stars, obviously, with what's going on in the U.S. to make that happen. We hope they do. Um, we understand the whole hypercar thing as well, too, and, and, and we've seen the budgets for those as well. And as you said, they're very costly. But um, our hope will be that we can move ourselves into Le Mans sometime, sometime, who knows when, uh, via the DPI program. Mm -hmm. And we'll see if that happens, but that would be our desire for sure. They'd get a lot more manufacturers in sure instantly. Absolutely. Mr. Mr. Penske is, is a actual living legend in, in car racing. Is, is it still a, a, a case, though, of win on Sunday, sell on Monday? Oh, we feel it is, for sure. I mean, especially right now in this Australian example, right? I mean, Mustang has been only in there a year and a half, and it's the second selling highest vehicle they have now in all of their category behind Ranger. I mean, that's a big statement over there for them. So we, we truly feel it is. And, and then for us personally, it's, it's win, on, win on Sunday and go sell on, uh, with our business partners on Monday. I mean, Roger will tell you for the 53 years we've been in racing now, it has built our brand. It has built our business, okay? Every single race we have customers there. Every single race we have our employees there. It's what we do. We don't, we don't golf on weekends. We don't go fishing on weekends. We go racing on weekends. And our businesses from trucks and cars ties naturally into the DNA of racing. And it's really been our secret sauce in terms of developing our business. And you have to also think about what do you learn? Okay, we lose almost 80% of the races we race in a year. Okay, think about that. Think about a good year we win 20%, right? This year hopefully it's 25 to 30. We lose more than we win. So you learn a lot more from losing than you learn from winning, frankly. And that goes for true in our businesses as well too. Organization, communication, technology, execution, planning. All those things happen in racing. All of them happen in the boardroom for us as well too. So this win on Sunday, sell on Monday thing, do you think, do you find it as big in the U.S. as, as it is in Australia where you have? Well, I think if you talk to, I think if you talk to the OEMs here in the U.S., they'll tell you absolutely. And, and, and that plus the transference of technology. I mean, look at this car, what's, what's being raced in NASCAR now and the transfer of technology to this vehicle on and off the racetrack as well, too. So I think it has to be very important still, um, or they wouldn't be doing what they're doing, plus the transference of technology, obviously. We got a question here from John Warniak from SEMA, who says racing and motorsports are still the gemba, the frontline fusion of sport marketing and technology. So, Bud, he'd like you to give your perspectives on why racing is still relevant to automotive innovation as we move into this world of mobility. Well, it's it's a good question because I think, as you mentioned, these these technologies around hybrid that are going to be coming sometime in the future, whether it be to NASCAR, IndyCar, other sports in the future. You've seen, the obviously, the E-Series and FIA. Um, what we're putting in these cars now are simply what Ford is providing us from a technology perspective and a Chevrolet is providing us technology perspective. And the development that we, we put in that Ilmore engine that we developed along with Chevrolet that is in the Indy cars, truly, from an ignition standpoint, from an electronic ignition standpoint, from what we put in there in terms of the bearings and everything else, it has great relevance to what goes in these cars today on the, on, on the production assembly line as well, too. So there is a terrific transference of that technology and, and, those, and those capabilities. And, and it's also a great ground. We, have, we never forget about this, too, is the engineers that, that, that are producing and building these great cars production-wise, so many of them have come from the racetrack and back and forth. It is a great proving ground. It is a great breeding ground for people as well, too. And we can never lose sight of that fact alone, too. We, we, we don't talk about that enough, but it's a very important part of the elements as well. Hey, let's talk about the Detroit Grand Prix. You're the chairman of it. Uh, tough, tough race. Number one, it comes a week after yeah. Indy. So here's everybody been setting up for an oval for, uh, for weeks at it. Now they got to haul everything to Detroit, not do one, but two races. Yeah. But it sure looks like this race has become a, a real fixture on the IndyCar racing circuit. Well, it has, and, it's, and as you said, it's, it's very unique because it's the only race in the only race weekend of the year to race two races, okay? Our track is hard enough for one race, right? It's a technical track, it's a bumpy track. Um, it's like a long beach, you got a lot of movement going around. You have a lot of transference from asphalt to concrete, back to asphalt again, 13 turns. There's not many runoffs, you have walls, okay? So a mistake is the end, end of your day typically for that day. And you got two races there. So, so that alone, and as you said, coming from Indy, you're, you're wiped out, you're tired. I mean, Indy's a very, 
emotional, mental race, okay? Physical as well, but so much mental. And then you're coming to Detroit and it's all physical, okay? And you gotta keep your wits about you. And also, that, that car you're racing on Saturday, you wanna race that car on Sunday as well, right? So those mechanics don't wanna be up until four o'clock in the morning fixing the problem you created on Saturday. So um, it's a great event for our city as well. You know, we, we will bring in about $50 million of benefit to our community next week. The hotels are filled right now. The restaurants will be filled. The bars will be filled. The vibe in the city is just tremendous that week. And we'll have 100,000 people come on to Belle Isle, many of which have never been there before. And that's the real, that's the real winner is Belle Isle, because almost $14 million of investment we've made to Belle Isle so far. And so, so talk about Belle Isle. I mean, for, yeah. for people who are not familiar with that, I mean, this is, this is something that you guys yeah. have really, I mean, the Penske organization has just transformed. Yeah, Belle Isle is an iconic island. We are the, one of the only cities in the, in, the, in the world, for that matter, to have this beautiful six-mile circumference island sitting between an international border, right? Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, who also designed Central Park, designed uh, uh, Belle Isle. It's a beautiful park. It held racing there many years before we got This is our 10th year doing it as Penske. This is our 30th anniversary of having Grand Prix in, in Detroit. It was once in the down street, downtown streets with F, F1 and now back on Belle Isle. So it's a beautiful park. Four million people a year will visit the park. That's a big number. So it's a great place for the public to recreate, but for those one weekend of the year, we're gonna put on an amazing motorsport event there. We are still the automotive capital of the world, and we are, we are but two miles from General Motors headquarters. We're in the shadow of their headquarters as Belle Isle, competing with their Chevrolets in the racetrack and their DPIs as well. And we also have a Trans Am race. So we have an IMSA race, which is a 100 minute long race, two IndyCar races, one Saturday, one Sunday, and two great Trans Am pony car races, one Saturday, one Sunday too. So, uh, so as you said, but Belle Isle needed a lot of help back in 06 when we came there. It was not a really good place. And we've now, with the DNR's help, have made it a safe place a treasured place, you have an aquarium, you have a beautiful conservatory, you have a yacht club there. It's a wonderful place to go visit. It is, and you guys have put a lot of money into fixing the whole place up, and yet some people are criticizing the race being on the island, saying, hey, this is a public park, you should not be taking this away from us. But it seems to me that's a, a vocal but minority that's saying that, not a whole lot of people. What's your sense of how that's all going? Yeah, we, we take great stock in that. You know. Our, in the Penske organization, you want to satisfy everybody. That's part of your DNA as well, right? We want to satisfy our customers and satisfy everybody out there. We don't want dissenters. But there are some people who don't want a race on a public park, right? And we understand that. So we have taken a lot of ch changes to get there and listening to them. We were once 90 days preparing this racetrack to get on and off, 90 days. Now it's, now it's less than 25, less than that. So 65 days we're going to be on the, on the island this year getting ready for the race. Remember. We have to build a racetrack and take it all back off. And we'll be off of there three weeks after the race ends. So um, we're also allowing more public access. We're allowing people to be on the island using our course much longer than we used to be as well too. And this time for the first year ever, we're allowing people to come down and get a pass and be on the island the full weekend at certain parts of it. it used to be closed off to the public unless you had a pass to the race. Now you can get on there as a public citizen during the course of that weekend. So we've listened to them, John, we understand that. Um, we've worked with them as well, we've spoken to them. You're still gonna have dissenters, and we understand that, but we also will tell them that, hey, we're gonna continue to invest in Belle Isle. We'll raise next Friday at the Grand Premier, it's a gala that we'll have. We hope to raise $1 million net, and we'll give a check to the Belle Isle Conservancy to say, this is yours to help Belle Isle. And if we didn't have the race there, the check wouldn't be available. Yeah, no, that's so true. It really is. What's your outlook for uh, the, the Belle Isle race? I mean, attendance-wise, uh, support races, all that sort of thing. Give us some of the background on what you see coming. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a well-supported race. Um, we have 75 companies that are sponsoring our race this year. That's an amazing number. It really is. And one third of them have been around since the day we brought this to, to us 10 years ago. You know, Lear, GM, the, of course the automotive suppliers are all part of this, right? And if it wasn't for GM, by the way, and Cadillac, we wouldn't be doing this. They are our partner. It's the Chevrolet Detroit Grand Prix presented by Lear. And Ray Scott and his team at Lear are dear partners of ours. Mark Royce is the driving influence which, of why we're IndyCar. Lloyd, War Lloyd Rice did the deal many years with Roger before then as the previous president of GM. And Mark said to us, we want to bring racing back to Belle Isle post-bankruptcy, and that's the reason why we're here. So we have three great racing series, five great races going on. 
concerts throughout the course of the weekend as well for the fans that maybe aren't a fan of racing. And 100,000 people will cross across that MacArthur Bridge to get on Belle Isle that weekend. And, and the overhead shots that we'll show on NBC network TV is a postcard to the world. They're just precious on our riverfront, what it looks like. So you, can, you can't put a value on that, but it's a big value. No, I, I, look, I've had friends from not here who have watched it on TV and told me that's Detroit yes. mm. because they were blown away at how good it looked. You're right. You're right. It really Let me is. Let ask you, since you mentioned the, the overhead shots, um, uh, you know, so you're in most series of racing these days, most of the big ones. Not an F1. I've been an F1 watcher for a long time, but it's gotten really boring, especially this year. And IndyCar racing has been so exciting for years. Uh, it almost always has. But what is it coming along to the point where it's, will it be as popular at any point as, say, NASCAR in the U.S.? Uh, how's that coming along in terms of viewership in terms of the fans. Yeah, well, the viewership for IndyCar is, is, is positive this year. It's up this year. And, and I think NBC's done a very good job with that this year. This is the first time NBC will be telecasting the Indy 500. They've done a marvelous job oh, with yeah. the lead-ups to it, right, the promotional lead-up to it. And uh, we're hoping for the same thing, of course, on Belle Isle when we have two races in you know, one weekend. So I, I think the sport is certainly on a trajectory up. You see the social media numbers. You see the attendance numbers. You see the TV numbers. They're very strong. Any sport on TV right now is going through some repercussions because of how it's consumed. Um, but IndyCar has shown some good growth there. So I'm looking forward to it. And it's also important now we have NBC and NBC Sports. We have two, not three. We've had three. You had ABC, you had NBC, you had NBC Sports. Where do I watch this race, the next race from, of IndyCar, right? Yeah. It's consistent now. Yeah. And Mike Tirico, having him on, on a broadcast, he's just a special guy, and, and, and he'll do a great job this weekend at the Indy 500, is, is going to be a great, uh, a great show. So will it be as popular as NASCAR? That's got a long ways to go. NASCAR is the 800-pound gorilla still in this, in this country, right, because it's stock cars. Uh, will it get back to the days before the cart and the splits back in the years? You know, I don't know. But we're happy with this series. Our sponsors are very happy with this series, and we continue to see it to grow. Um, and I love what Mark Miles, who's the CEO of the series, has done. Um, he's kept the tracks consistent now. We're not bouncing around going from here to there. It's consistent schedules. It's predictable schedules. And the racing is so competitive. You hit it right in the nose. Yeah. Look at Indy today. The Indy 500 poles are between one and three miles an hour, okay, between first and 33rd position. Graham Rahal told me a story. When his father drove, it was a four-mile-an-hour difference on the front row. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and today you're talking three to five mile an hour for the whole field. Yeah. That's how competitive right. it is. Moreover, you know, we saw three teams get bumped. Yes. You know, I, including, you know, McLaren. Run, including McLaren, McLaren and Alonso. Alonso. Yeah. But what I'm getting at is just a few years back, a decade ago, there was a scramble to try to get 33 cars just to enter. Right. Right. That's right. Now there's 36. I think it was 36, wasn't there it, were. trying to qualify? That's correct. So that shows health in the system, health in the series that... Right. That many more teams are, are finding the sponsors to go make a run at it. And the series has done a very good job to keep the cost down as well, okay? The engine costs, you know, we, we produce the Ilmer engine, of course, you know, through uh, uh, with the Chevy. And uh, the cost, the chassis costs, the use of the car, um, the kind of spec nature of the, of, of the Chevy car and the Honda car are able to keep costs down. So you can get people now to come into the sport that aren't going to bankroll you know, themselves with these high, high dollars you used to have to have. And you can do it competitively for a reasonable amount now. So that also has brought other people into the sport now, which is important. So bump day was fun. I mean, those, those three cars, I mean, you saw the stress on Alonzo's face, yeah. right? A world champion. And he didn't make the Indy 500 show. Now, I think <laughs> they learned a lot. By, it was by three three hundredths yes. of a mile that's a, an that's hour. A, that's blinking an <laughs> yeah. eye. I mean, it was like, it's like right? I couldn't believe that was yeah. this yeah. between him and the uh, 33rd. That tight, wasn't it? It was amazing. But you know what it also shows is it's a very sophisticated series, even though it's been criticized by some for being a spec series. Here comes a premier Formula One team with a Formula One champion. They couldn't make the field. Absolutely. Now, there's a number of reasons why they couldn't. 
but it shows that you just don't come and run because you've done well in another series. You got to know what you're doing. You got to know what you're doing. The bearings are different. Your dampers are different. Your setups are different. Everything is everything. Is, the car may sound spec, but boy, it's a long way from that when we look under the under the hood of that car in terms of what we're doing versus what the Andrettis are doing. So, uh, and we love that competitiveness. We want to make a difference with that, but also keep our costs low enough to make it reasonable people to be in the sport. That's important for us as well, too. And make some money. And make I mean, some money. you're not yeah. just racing for the fun of it. Your teams turn a profit. Yeah, we 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 don't turn much profit, but <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it's uh, it's but that's not the important part of it for us, really. We're, we're you know, as Roger calls it, racing is our common thread. Okay, and if we make if we lose, you know, something this year and make it back next year, the board has never argued about that. Okay, what does this mean to our business? Is how we look at it. Okay, with 63,000 employees now that we have around the world, they are talking at the water cooler on Monday morning about what happened yesterday, what happened on Saturday. How can you put a value on that? And that's helped us build our business, and that is the real return for us. It really is. Right now, Indy is a Chevrolet versus Honda battle. There's been rumors out there maybe another manufacturer would come in. There's a rule change coming in 2021, I think it is. 2020, 2022 engine change, okay. correct? And um, some more horsepower and perhaps. Yeah, okay. they're looking right now. And we have a 2.1, uh, 2.2 point liter, uh, 2.2 liter engine. They're looking at maybe a 2.4 liter engine, if someone else comes in. Um, um, perhaps, uh, but the IndyCar series is looking for that next person to bring in. We, we support that. We'd like to see a third provider or a fourth provider as well, too. Um, Chevrolet and Honda support that as well, too. So they're all behind that, too. So whatever we can do to bring other manufacturers in here is important for us. And that's why this cost piece is so important right now, right? Um, remember, we raced that IndyCar engine about over 2,000 miles before we change it. Hmm. Which is unreal. Miles. That is unreal. Okay, we race a NASCAR engine, typically one race. Right, so think about the durability and reliability you have to have in that engine to be able to do that, and that's very important for us to keep the cost down low. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's see, uh, we've got a, a couple of questions from the audience here. Nike HM69, what about Formula One? For us, yeah, for Penske, yeah, we did it I know. many, many years ago. I know, and, of course, and you know, did pretty well. John Watson won a race for us, if you recall, back in the day. But um, you know, even though we're a global company. Um, uh, we are in pockets of the globe, right? We've got about 10,000 employees now in the UK and about 1,000 throughout Spain and, 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 and Germany and, and Italy and about another 700 in Australia working for us now. And um, we like to race where our people are typically and where our businesses are. And we're, we're not in Shanghai. We're not in other businesses like in, in South America. So, and as you know, it's a highly costly program as well too. You've got to have a manufacturer that's behind you, funding that program like a Ferrari and Mercedes do. God bless Gene Haas for what he does, okay? Yeah. Um, and, uh, but it's hard, and we've got enough to keep us busy right now with, 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 with the four programs that we're involved in, right? And we love what we're doing with those four programs. Oh yeah, because you know, I'm gonna guess three to four hundred million dollars is what it's gonna take to run F1. It would have to be, absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, those are crazy numbers, right? Yeah. And you gotta have that manufacturer to support you doing that. Mm -hmm. Le Mans is probably a better deal anyway for, for the time being, right? We love Le Mans, we'd love to go there. That's, that's the one race Roger hasn't, hasn't been to in a long time and we need to win. Yeah, okay, uh, Lyris Blake says, any plans for Mopar performance in racing? Well, you know, we won Clearly the last. Clearly, a Mopar fan here. Yeah, we won the last, you know, championship with Dodge, right? The last year and um, in 2012 with Brad Keselowski in the NASCAR program, and and the year that, of course, we win was the last year that Dodge was involved in the series. So uh, we love Dodge to be back and Mopar to be back involved in NASCAR or IMSA for that matter, right? And uh, we held on to the very last year with them and won the championships. We went off, we went off with them on a very high note. Mm -hmm. Now we were very proud of that and very proud of them for the organization. Ralph Jill's then in the organization. They're they're great partners, got great vehicles, great power cars. Of course, still with the Challenger and the Chargers, and uh, love to see them back. But that's their decision, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Ralph would love to go racing again. He'll be on the show, by the way, in a couple of months. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Great designer. Yeah, great guy. It really is. Look, we're gonna have to wrap it up, but. But real interesting stuff, you know. What an amazing organization. Penske is into so many different things. But as a motor racing fan, I love the fact that racing is the glue that sort of binds it all together. It is. It's, a, it's the common thread, as Roger says. And, uh, 
you know, we we have a lot of trophies we won, but those are those are the histories, right? Our 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 future is looking at the next trophy that's ahead of us, and we've got a couple of them this weekend: one in Xfinity Series, one in the Cup Series, and of course, IndyCar, and two more in Australia. So. There's five trophies ahead of us that we're trying to get, so we'll see. I know I'm supposed to be impartial, but I'm pulling for Elio's fourth uh, this coming. Wouldn't that be Sunday. great? Yeah, yeah. nothing better. And to have him, and to have that, and have him come and race the IMSA cars here next weekend would be just would be just special, wouldn't it? To be a winner. You know, he almost would. ran over my wife with uh, with uh, one of those little scooters at <laughs> Belle Isle a few years ago. So, so she's a big fan of him too. <laughs> uh, good. No, that's great. I'm glad he didn't run over. <laughs> right. Well, for those who are in Detroit who haven't gone to the Detroit race, I mean, the Penske organization has the whole thing orchestrated so very well. I mean, it's it's well, thank it's, you. It's we, easy to yeah. to yeah. negotiate, which isn't the case in all Yeah, we try to, races. We, what I, I refer to it as, we want to make it a concierge experience for you at a racetrack. Yeah, Look, I, mean, I, just, I, I haven't missed one, and I would totally agree that you've achieved it. And uh, it, it's great to see, you know, what you're doing for Belle Isle and, and well, the whole sure you're not missing one again. Here's your parking passes for the island, oh. John, and your chalet passes <laughs> at my chalet as well. So. Awesome. Okay? Awesome, awesome. <laughs> that, all right. <laughs> that's really good. I, I can't wait. So thanks again for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure having you well, here. Great, great to be here. Great talking with love, you. Love what you guys do for the industry. You're just great experts about what's going on on the production car side, but also the race car side. So uh, always great content. Good deal. Thank you. Todd, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having uh, Always good to have you. Still doing well? I'm still doing well. Okay, yes. I just want to check. <laughs> <laughs> Even Gary? better now after the show. So okay. Good. And... We'll do this again next week. Why don't we do that? Okay, real good. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live. Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv. Honda, though, so. Yeah. You are? Okay. But, but thank you. Yeah, yeah, Honda, Chevrolet, right, Bridgestone, a bunch of... Items. So I'll bring, have two of them taken, brought That'd be up awesome. for you. That'd be awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, it's Saturday. We're going out to M City, where the SAE with General Motors is doing this thing called uh, Auto Drive, Auto Project. Anyway, they've signed up. I can't remember six, Auto seven. Drive Challenge. Auto Drive Challenge. Auto Challenge. Okay. So they've got like eight universities across the United States. They've given them cars, uh, Chevy, uh, cr not cruises. What's the the Sonic? Uh, no, wait, what's uh, the, the, the Spark? AV one? Bolt. Spark. Bolt. 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 The Bolt. Yeah. So they've given them bolts and said, make them autonomous. Interesting. It's a, it's a three-year competition. Wow. And last year was sort of like evaluating everything. This year they got to go to M-City and they got to do all this autonomous driving. And then next year they go someplace else and they really ratchet it up again. But anyway... SAE asked us to come do this show oh, neat. at M City uh, uh, two Saturdays from yeah. now. So that's yeah. why we're going to miss uh, Saturday. Okay. All right, well, I'll have two dropped off to you. Yeah, then. no, that's cool. Like I said, I, I don't think I've missed a race yet. Yeah, well, you'll be, 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 be my guest now. And the most valuable thing is on, on island parking. So, yeah. <laughs> I, th that is, I'm is, is precious. Well, I've got yeah. I've got 520 cars in the car corral this year, and I have nowhere to go because that ground is underwater right wow. now. There has been so much yeah. rain, mm. and the R Detroit River is the highest it's been in 40 years. Unreal. Wow. I mean, Unreal. you would not believe the water down there. So, But our guys are working their tails off. We're pumping right now. we got three pumps, industrial pumps, bigger than me. We're pumping 11,000 gallons a minute with Times three, 33,000 gallons a minute we're pushing off that island right now, trying to keep it. Well, let's hope it stops raining. It rained this yeah. morning. Crazy. It yeah. rained hard this morning. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. just, we even had three or four days straight of good weather. Yeah, right. I remember that Our one problem. year there was a lot of hay that you had to lay down. All that mulch, $500,000 of mulch I put down there. And then, I had to, then I had to bring it all back out. Yeah, that was just ridiculous. So I put French drains down. It cost me about a quarter million the next year. I put all French drains down throughout the area that we do. Well, that'll make a big difference. Now it's draining, yeah. but, but the areas I didn't.
like the car corral, it's just saturated. So Man. we're uh, we're we're doing some hail marys. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see. All right. That's All right. Well, look for those tickets. I'll bring them over to him. Drop them. Sure. Off this sure. Week. Sure. Okay. Yeah.